how did I get pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, today in this talk, um, I'll show you a little bit of clinical information. We'll touch on a bit of biology about what's going on in the lung there at a microscopic level in pulmonary fibrosis. And we'll touch on a bit of physiology, which is the consequences for the person and the body if you have pulmonary fibrosis. I'll try to uh, state when I'm talking about things that we are sure that we know, that we're certain about, things that we think are right, that we think that we know are true. And there are some areas where we really only have a few ideas and there's much more scope for research in the future to understand these things. And I'll, I'll try and explain when we're uh, really guessing like that, but I'll introduce you to some, uh, some ideas about how you get pulmonary fibrosis in this talk. These are my declarations for this talk. To set the scene, I'm going to give you a little clinical case. And I work in a, in a hospital that has a, a specialist centre for interstitial lung disease that encompasses pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm going to give you an example clinical case of a, a sort of patient who might be referred to my clinic by their general practitioner. It's a it's a theoretical case, it's made up, but it, uh, it would be fairly typical of the sort of patient who would be coming along to see me. And, and many of the things in the case uh, may well resound with many of you in the audience from what you've already told us uh, about what you, what you suffer from. So a man of 75 years complains that he's been short of breath when walking for about a year or so. It's getting a bit worse. His medical history, that is the things that are otherwise wrong with him, high blood pressure, that's very common, on some medication for that that controls the blood pressure. There are no other medical conditions. Importantly, there is no family history of lung disease. We'll touch on that later. He had been a smoker of tobacco until a couple of decades earlier and stopped in his mid-50s. He'd worked as a labourer. Uh, that's important. In, in respiratory medicine, in my specialty, we're very interested in people's occupation uh, because certain occupations are prone to develop certain respiratory diseases. And in the context of pulmonary fibrosis, we're particularly interested in dust inhalation, particularly asbestos, which is used, uh, was widely used uh, for building and insulation and fire insulation and uh, is, a, is a recognized cause of pulmonary fibrosis. So, but this man being a laborer, uh, exposed to the building trade would be at risk of asbestos exposure, but he couldn't specifically recall any. He has no pets at home, in particular birds. We'll come back to that. His general practitioner did a very appropriate physical examination. That is, he'd listened to the patient's chest with a stethoscope, heard some abnormal noises that sounded like crackles, and there were possibly some abnormal abnormalities in the fingers that are described as finger clubbing. We'll come back to that. He arranged a chest x-ray and referred the patient uh, to the hospital clinic. The chest x-ray looks something like this. We're not going to talk about interpretation of chest x-rays today, but this chest x-ray is mildly abnormal with some increased shadowing at the bottom of both lungs. What we do in the hospital service to make a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis is a CT scan. This is the definitive test to make a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis. It's called a high resolution CT scan. It's th that's nothing to do with the scanner. It's just a normal CT scanner. The high resolution bit just refers to the way the computer acquires the data and then processes the image. And uh, many of you, uh, by the sounds of it, from what you've told us in the polls, will have undergone CT scanning, which nowadays, as you all know, is a very, very quick and simple technique that gives us beautiful pictures. And there's an example slice through a person's chest on the right hand side that shows a pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. And these are given all sorts of um, complicated names, which are not particularly helpful and are steeped in history, but you may have come across terms like UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia, which is a way of describing the pattern of fibrosis that we might see on a scan. It's not a disease in itself. And in this particular case, this man has this particular scan, and uh, that is very characteristic of the common type of pulmonary fibrosis that we see. What we like to do then is to try and put a diagnostic label on this, and I'll just give you a few possible diagnostic labels, like the ones that Steve asked you in the, in the poll, uh, which some people in the audience here are affected by. 
So the rheumatic diseases, which are referred to in medical textbooks as, as connective tissue diseases, and we're talking about things like rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma. Some medications that people take, but not blood pressure medications that our patient was taking. And we couldn't uh, elicit a history of asbestos exposure, so we don't think it's any of those. The pattern on the CT is not typical of these so-called granulomatous lung diseases, like sarcoidosis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But it is typical of the commonest fibrotic lung disease that we see, which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis at the top of the list there on the right-hand side. He has no family history, so it's not familial, and it's not a pattern of this other type of pulmonary fibrosis called NSRP. So I'm really, I don't, I, I'm not really wanting people to remember these names or even understand them, but it's really just to give you a flavor of the sorts of diagnostic labels uh, that, uh, that we will try to apply um, to distinguish the different types of pulmonary fibrosis. Does that matter or do all types of pulmonary fibrosis have common beginnings? I think they probably do, and we'll come on to that shortly. So I'm just going to, with that little introduction from that clinical scenario, I'm just going to mention what our learning objectives are from this webinar today. And this is, these are the learning objectives that I've been asked to address. And uh, symptoms and signs, that's what a, a doctor or nurse finds uh, when they're talking to you or examining you. Some of the physiological consequences, what, does, what happens in the body as a result, we'll come on to that. Uh, and, but uh, early on, we'll have uh, a bit about the biology in terms of causes, but I prefer to uh, use the term risk factors because I think cause is a bit strong. A risk factor means something that you may have or may have happened to you that puts you at increased risk of pulmonary fibrosis. And we know what the risk factors are. Um, and we'll come on then uh, to talk about why pulmonary fibrosis happens and how it happens um, at, a, at a biological microscopic level to see if we can try to understand uh, what's going on in pulmonary fibrosis. So maybe just a little bit of history to start with, really, just to, uh, uh, just to kick things off. Um, this doesn't seem to be a disease that's been around for, uh, uh, for centuries or millennia. This is one of the earliest descriptions of pulmonary fibrosis by the Irish physician Sir Dominic Corrigan in the early 1800s. Uh, he referred to cirrhosis of the lung. Cirrhosis is, of course, a, a, a disease of the liver, commonly due to alcohol or virus infection, but the liver becomes scarred, and he recognised that people with pulmonary fibrosis had scarring of the lung, uh, similar to scarring of the liver. Jumping forward over a century, um, this guy was a big name in pulmonary fibrosis. Avril, Avril Lebo was an American pathologist, so he looked at bits of tissue under the microscope, uh, and he was one of the first people to describe the terminology that we still use um, uh, to describe what the lungs look like, both grossly, here, as in here, and microscopically under the microscope in people with fi uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So what about symptoms and signs? Well, we've already touched on these really in our little case scenario. So the symptoms that our patient had of progressive shortness of breath on exertion, typically over a year or so before a person get di gets diagnosed. I wonder if that resonates with the uh, some or many of you in the audience, and typically in a person over the age of 50. This is not a disease generally that occurs in very young people. Some of the types of pulmonary fibrosis that I mentioned earlier can occur in people less than 50, especially when associated with scleroderma or some of the other rheumatic diseases. But the more common types of pulmonary fibrosis, especially IPF, uh, are diseases of older people. And we'll come back to how age might relate to pulmonary fibrosis risk a bit later in the webinar. Some people have a, a dry cough, by that I mean a cough that doesn't produce sputum or phlegm. And that can be a, a big problem that's difficult to treat. A sign is a medical term that means something that your doctor or nurse finds when they examine you. So very characteristic, as our patient did, are these crackles that can be heard with a stethoscope when listening to the lungs. The, the word Listening, for listening to, the, listening to a part of the body with a stethoscope is called auscultation. There's a word uh, coined by René Lenec, the French physician who invented the stethoscope uh, a long time ago. So uh, listening to the lungs with a stethoscope will reveal these crackles. And that's quite a good 
early feature of pulmonary fibrosis that, um, that we teach our medical students and our young doctors to look out for. And if we were thinking about how to tr try and pick up pulmonary fibrosis early, uh, that's actually probably one of the best ways of doing it, uh, and so very simple as well. This phenomenon of finger clubbing, which is an expansion of the end of the fingers, such that the normal angle between the nail and the finger is lost, um, is associated with pulmonary fibrosis for reasons that are not entirely clear. Uh, so if you, know, if you know someone with finger clubbing, that, that merits uh, further investigation of their lungs. So I said that I prefer to use the, the phrase risk factors rather than cause. So let's have a think now about some of the risk factors. And some of these I've tried to introduce in that little case scenario described earlier. So we talked about how our patients didn't have a family, patient didn't have a family history of pulmonary fibrosis. And by family history, I mean an affected first degree relative. So that would be a parent, a brother, a sister, or possibly a child. And we think that probably about one in 10 people have a family history that is an affected first degree relative, which is what's described in this family tree at the bottom, uh, where uh, a, a father has an affected son and two affected daughters. And sometimes that does happen. So there is a genetic predisposition. If you if you're a family member of someone with pulmonary fibrosis, that, that of course leads to some anxiety. Your reassurance is that most pulmonary fibrosis is not familial, is not genetic, but some is. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. And that's carried on the genes. And if you want to know about more about how genes and pulmonary fibrosis are studied, I would very much recommend the uh, webinar um, that's on the Action for Pulmonary Fibrosis uh, web, web pages. So what other risk factors apart from genes and family history? Well, smoke exposure, tobacco, other dusts, and asbestos, as we've touched on, are definitely risk factors for developing pulmonary fibrosis. This picture here is a, is, is a, is a copy of a, a painting of, that's supposed to be of Sir Walter Raleigh smoking his pipe with the dog there. And of course, he was the, the man who was uh, credited with introducing uh, tobacco uh, into England and um, uh, and other duck, but but tobacco smoking of cigarette, cigarettes particularly is a risk factor and often like in the case scenario that I described to you, uh, people have smoked in the past, although not necessarily currently at the time uh, that they get diagnosed. And on the right is a picture of a block of asbestos, which is this naturally occurring fibrous mineral that was used widely for heat insulation boiler rooms, engine rooms, ships, um, and people who work directly with asbestos and inhaled a lot of asbestos were at risk of getting pulmonary fibrosis. And perhaps some other dusts, wood dusts, metal dusts uh, as well. And, and, and Steve mentioned uh, silica dust um, and people who work with stone. So dust exposure, yes. What, el what else could people breathe in that would put them at increased risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis? Well, some people develop this condition called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and some of you uh, tick that box in the poll. That's a reaction in the lung that's really immune mediated, and it's uh, due to something organic that's breathed in. And organic here, I mean something that's either alive or used to be alive. And the, and the, and the classic example is, is pigeon dander. So pigeon fanciers developing disease in the lung that can turn into pulmonary fibrosis, but not always. Perhaps some other moles, uh, fungi, yeast, and some other occupations uh, can put people at risk of uh, inhaling some organic allergens that may drive pulmonary fibrosis. So certainly in my clinic, uh, we always ask very, very carefully what sort of things people might have been exposed to as part of their life, work, leisure, because it may be important. What other things that might, might people breathe into their lungs that might put them at risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis? Well, there's been much interest lately in what we call aspiration. So what we mean by this is that, is that substances that should be in the food pipe, that is the esophagus or the stomach, coming back up, going past the voice box and being breathed back into the lungs. And um, 
you know, the food pipe, the esophagus, and the windpipe, the trachea, are connected at the back of the throat. So if things do come up, they can come up silently, they don't have to be acidic, uh, and they could, little bits, be repeatedly breathed into the lungs without people being aware of it. And that may be uh, linked to pulmonary fibrosis. So we're always on the lookout for that as well. We've talked about the rheumatic diseases like rheumatoid. The, uh, you know, about one in 10 people with rheumatoid arthritis will develop some degree of pulmonary fibrosis. So not everybody, but some. Um, why that is, is not entirely clear. Uh, in rheumatology now, there are fantastic medications for treating rheumatoid arthritis that will largely prevent the sort of deformity seen on this particular slide with the joints. The problem is those medications for the rheumatoid are not so good at treating the lung fibrosis that occurs with rheumatoid for some reason. So they're not quite as successful there. So we need better treatments for rheumatoid and related diseases like scleroderma, where you can get pulmonary fibrosis. But we always want to know whether, whether a person has evidence of any of these sorts of diseases. And it's usually obvious, uh, but sometimes not. So for some of the other um, diseases that are related to rheumatoid, it can be difficult to pick them up. And sometimes some more detailed blood testing may be helpful there, which we will do. Now, some medications may increase people's risk of pulmonary fibrosis. I don't want to worry people in the audience or think, oh, my goodness, what am I... What, what have I been taking that might do it? Actually, for pulmonary fibrosis, they are few and far between. There are only three or four of them, really. The classic example is a drug called bleomycin, which is a, an anti-cancer drug. So you would know if you'd ever had bleomycin. And indeed, it's now used in one of the experimental models in the laboratory to induce pulmonary fibrosis. So, um, so that would be very obvious. The commonest one that we see nowadays is an antibiotic called nitrofurantoin, which is often used long term, six months or more, for treating urinary infections. So people who take long term nitrofurantoin should be aware that sometimes it can cause lung problems. So there we have our little collection of risk factors. And as you might imagine, they're risk factors. They're not causes. And as you might imagine, people may have more than one of these. You know, you may have a bit of a family history. You may have smoked a bit. And the combination of that inherent genetic susceptibility plus some or more of these exposures is enough as you get older to cause you to develop pulmonary fibrosis. So I hope, that, uh, I hope that's informative about risk factors. So let's have a little bit, little bit look, look a little bit closer now at a kind of microscopic level at what's going on here. So to understand this, we need to think about which bit of the lung we're looking at. And we're talking about the air sacs right at the very end of this tree of airway tubes in the lung, which is designed to take air right down to the air sacs, which is the business part of the lung. Uh, where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air and the blood goes on. So there are about 20 or so divisions of these airways down to these little air sacs, which are magnified here on the right-hand side, and they're called alveoli. And they're often presented as these kind of little bunch of grapes on the end of a, on the end of a stalk. So let's have a look at those in more detail. So I've taken a, an even more simplistic view of an alveolus, and so this is uh, an alveolar air sac, about 500 million of these uh, in, in the human lungs. And the little bronchus, the little airway going into it is about, you know, about half a millimeter in diameter. So we're really at a pretty microscopic level here. But this is the business end of the lungs. The air in the alveolus is in close proximity to the blood circulating through the lungs in the capillaries demonstrated here. And there's a little gap in between, which I've expanded here just for artistic sake, a bit of artistic license, but normally you get, this is hardly a gap at all. But uh, this is where the problem occurs in pulmonary fibrosis is in this gap between the air and the blood. And this gap is called the interstitium, which is why these diseases, as you may know, are often referred to as interstitial lung diseases. Let's have a look at that gap in a little bit more detail. Zoom in. So here's the interstitium between the air and the blood. What's in there normally then? Well, in there normally, there are a few of these cells called fibroblasts. And what these fibroblast cells do is they produce a protein called elastin. And elastin, as you might expect from its name, is a, is a stretchy 
protein, and it's what gives the lungs their stretch. So you, the lungs are like balloons. You can, when you breathe in, they stretch up and they're very elastic. The breathing out process, when we expire, breathe out, that's a purely passive process. We don't need any muscles to do that. The air just comes out because it's like a balloon. It pulls back into itself. And it's that elastin that gives the lungs that, their flexibility and their stretch. So what goes on in pulmonary fibrosis that goes wrong here? Let's remove some of these labels and remove the elastin. What goes on here? Well, what happens is these fibroblasts start to proliferate. They divide and more of them appear. And instead of producing elastin, they change their tune and they decide to produce a different protein called collagen. Collagen is scar tissue. It's what we do, what the body does when it's trying to heal a wound. So these fibroblasts are proliferating and produce collagen, which acts like a kind of cement. It's not stretchy and it cements and stiffens the lungs. And this is what happens when we, when we try to heal a wound. So you can think of it like the lungs are trying to heal a wound here, but there isn't really a wound, but they're trying to heal a wound. The interstitium then expands, it gets wider because it's filling up with all these cells and all this cement collagen. Some of these fibroblasts become very much like muscle cells. They're called myofibroblasts, big fat cells that produce even more collagen and uh, filling up this space. So we end up, if we zoom back out again, with a picture on the right, like pulmonary fibrosis, with an expanded interstitium full of uh, cells, fibroblasts, and collagen, and compared with the normal situation on the, on, on the left-hand side. So I've really tried to explain to you there how it happens, but I haven't really tried to explain at all why. So I think we're fairly sure that this is how it happens, because when we take a sample of a person's lung, like if you have a lung biopsy, some of you in the audience may have had a surgical lung biopsy and look at it under the microscope. This is what we see. We see an expanded interstitium between the air and the blood full of these fibroblasts and full of collagen. So this is what we're pretty certain uh, has happened. Um, I guess the real question, if we're really going to get to the bottom of pulmonary fibrosis, is why does that process happen? And we've talked about some risk factors, but uh, how is that linked to why this happens? Well, let's have a little think about that a little bit more. Let's zoom into the normal situation a little bit more and have a think about, okay, these fibroblasts are going to proliferate and produce lots of collagen. Why do they do that? Why are they trying to heal a wound when, when there's not a wound there? And so let's have a think about some of the other cells that are around, because this is a very simplistic diagram, and I've missed a few things out deliberately for simplicity. Well, in the air spaces, there are other cells. This is a macrophage, a large eating cell from the Greek that scavenges particles. And that might, the macrophages may be important players. In the blood on the bottom right, of course, there are blood cells. There are white blood cells, there are red blood cells, and there are platelets which are involved in, in blood clotting. And you know, any one of these cells, the uh, macrophage here, the green epithelial cells lining the airspace, the red endothelial cells lining the blood vessel, the blood cells, or the macrophage may all be important players in turning these fibroblasts on in the first place. So we could have the epithelial cells telling the fibroblast to proliferate, the endothelial cells, the macrophage, the platelets, the white blood cells, and there may be crosstalk between these various different cells. They may be interacting with each other before telling the fibroblast what to do. And it's in this area about why it happens, where, which is um, a, a very active research area, both in the UK and worldwide, but this is where most of the great unknowns uh, still lie. So what I'm telling you now is much more speculative and guesswork based on early research evidence rather than the more certain things that I've told you before about risk factors and how it happens. So just thinking about you know, one of these cell interactions, let's have a look at the epithelial cells. So this is a popular hypothesis about why pulmonary fibrosis happens, and something goes wrong with the lining cells of the alveolar airspace here. And I've, described, I've shown these epithelial cells slightly differently. Some are flat and some are a bit fatter. These big fat ones are called the type two alveolar epithelial cells, and their job throughout the lifetime of a person is to divide and produce more of the other type one 
alveolar epithelial cells. So they divide and divide and divide. And so they replenish, replace and repair the alveolar epithelium lining on a continual basis. And the problem with that, constantly dividing throughout the lifetime of a person, is that uh, as they get older, they eventually give up the ghost. They say, I can't do this anymore. Um, it's not really working. I can't keep dividing and replenishing and repairing the lining of that airspace. It's like they become old prematurely. And in biology, we call this senescence. So this epithelial cell becomes senescent and it can no longer divide and it does get bigger, which is what I've demonstrated here. And one of the other things that senescent cells do, we think, is send out chemical signals like a distress signal. Yeah. And help. I can no longer uh, fulfill my function anymore. And it may be these chemical signals uh, that are starting the fibroblast proliferation that is the, the onset of the pulmonary fibrosis. This senescence is a real phenomenon. Uh, we can study it in the laboratory. These are some pictures taken by my PhD student in our laboratory. And these are some alveolar epithelial cells, uh, for normal ones on the top left here, and the senescent ones on the top right. And you can see that those cells are bigger. And when she uses a stain to look for senescent cells that show stained senescent cells blue, in the bottom right, uh, the senescent cells stain up blue, or some of them do, as opposed to the normal ones, which, which don't. So it's a real phenomenon that can be studied in the laboratory. And it's really premature aging of these cells. And it is relevant because uh, some of the genetic risk factors that have been identified, if you look at uh, Richard Allen's webinar on the APF web pages that I was referring to, are some of the genes that have been shown to increase or confer risk of pulmonary fibrosis are uh, involved in uh, processes that can lead to senescence. And those uh, processes relate to these bits on the end of the chromosome. So all of our DNA that, uh, that describes our genes is present in the nucleus of every nucleated cell in the body in the form of 23 pairs of chromosomes. And when a cell divides, like that epithelial cell is trying to divide to replenish and repair, uh, the DNA has to replicate itself. It has to produce two copies uh, from one. And to do that, the machinery that does that DNA replication grabs a hold of the chromosomes at the ends here on these areas called telomeres. I'm circling them here in gray. So the ends of the chromosomes are where the replication machinery grabs hold of. And with each cell division, they get shorter because they can't be replicated because that's where the machinery grabs on. So as cells age, the telomeres become shorter. And it seems that short telomeres, when, if the telomeres become so short that the cell can no longer divide properly, that then leads to this process of senescence that I've shown you. And some of the genes that confer pulmonary fibrosis risk are related to length of telomeres and, can, and, and lead to short telomeres. So there's a link between genetics, senescence, premature aging, and some of the biology that I've told you about. And I suspect that the reason that pulmonary fibrosis is generally a disease of older people is because obviously as we get older, our telomeres get shorter anyway. So if they're a bit short to start with, anything more on top of that uh, can lead to this particular process. Now, I don't want you to go away from this thinking that this is the, the, the be all and end all of, of what, why pulmonary fibrosis happens. The senescent story is just one uh, uh, cog in the machine, one area of research interest, and there are others that we don't have time to talk about today. But I'm just throwing that in there as an example of trying to explain why this process might happen. Now, if this process has happened and we've got this wound healing response, we then have to ask, well, why doesn't it go away? Because if we cut ourselves, for example, or cut the skin, we have a wound healing response, we have a scar form, but eventually that scar disappears. The cells go away, the fibroblasts go away, the collagen gets dissolved by enzymes that we can produce in our body to dissolve it. But that doesn't happen in pulmonary fibrosis. It gets worse rather than better. Why does that but why doesn't it get resolved by itself? Well, this we don't know at all, but it could be that there are ongoing signals from the epithelium, senescence, from the blood, or it may be that the fibrosis itself, once it's there, 
drives more fibrosis somehow. And um, and so once it's started, it's like a it's like a train that's got going and it's not going to stop. And that's uh, that's possibly what happens. Finally, I'm going to finish with um, some physiological consequences of pulmonary fibrosis. And one of the things that happens if you have pulmonary fibrosis, because they're full of this collagen cement, is the lungs get smaller. They're less elastic, less stretchy, and they get smaller. And we can see this in real life by looking at a chest X-ray, for example. Here are some real chest X-rays taken six years apart uh, from a single person. You'll know that when you have an x-ray, you take a big breath in. So both times the person's tried to take a big breath in. But one of the things that is apparent is that the x-ray on the right, after six years, the lungs are smaller than on the left. They're shorter from top to bottom than they were before. And this can also be measured using lung function tests. And one of the key measurements that we measure when we do your lung function tests and repeat them is the lung capacity, the size of the lungs. And that's an important measurement. As the lungs fill with the collagen cement and, and are smaller and stiffer, they don't expand so well when we breathe. Here's a little animation of some normal lungs breathing on the left and some pulmonary fibrosis lungs breathing less well on the right. And I'm going to finish off with a suggestion that this is important in terms of generating the sensation of breathlessness, of shortness of breath that people feel with pulmonary fibrosis. So these lungs are not expanding as much as they can. Breathing is controlled by nerve signals from the brain. So signals to breathe are sent out from the brain through the spinal cord to the muscles that make us breathe, the diaphragms underneath our lungs and the muscles of our rib cages. So the brain is controlling this. Then there are stretch receptors in the lungs that send signals back to the brain about how well the lungs are moving. That's so that if we breathe in, we know when we've taken a full breath in and don't need to breathe in anymore and we can breathe out, for example. And of course, the pulmonary in pulmonary fibrosis, the lungs are not breathing in as well as they should. So the signals coming back to the brain are confusing the brain about what's going on. There's not enough breathing, there's not enough stretch. And it's this mismatch between what the brain thinks it sh should be happening and what's actually happening that leads to the sensation of breathlessness as interpreted by the higher centers in the brain. And so there's an uncoupling between what the brain is telling the lungs to do and what's actually happening there. And actually repro trying to reprogram people's um, perception of these signals is actually key in trying to help people with shortness of breath. And that's what we do in, in breathlessness clinics. And that's what we do um, in, as part of pulmonary rehabilitation. So I'm gonna leave you with that thought. Hopefully that's been useful. I apologize that I appear to have run a little over the 20 minutes that we had allocated, but I'm gonna finish there, hand back to Steve. Thank you for your attention. And um, I think we'll uh, move on to the Q&A, Steve, yeah? Yep, indeed we will, Simon. Great, thank you very much indeed. That was a really excellent and yeah, stimulating talk. I'm always amazed whenever I hear you talk at how you manage to explain complex ideas so simply. Yeah, a clearly mark of a great teacher. Yeah. Um, we got uh, quite a few interesting questions in the Q&A and some others have come in through WhatsApp to me. Um, we're due to finish at nine. We could go for an extra 10 minutes or so if we if we have to, but let, let's see. Both my brothers on the participant says have contracted IPF. One died 13 years ago, the other currently has it. One was a smoker, one never smoked. Being their younger sister, I'm obviously concerned that this might run in families. What do you think? So thank you. And that, so, so what I'm gonna, how I'm gonna answer this, Steve, is I'm just kinda trying to give some general answers um, rather than about, about the questions. Yes, no, okay. Okay. Yes, so no, I'm gonna give you some, some yeah. general information about, about familial risk, which is what this, this is about. So as I've already said, the first thing to say is that most pulmonary fibrosis is not familial, it's uh, sporadic, occurs by chance. So that's one reassuring thing. Um, of course, even if you have a family history, uh, an affected first degree relative, brother or sister, um, and that may increase your risk of pulmonary fibrosis, but pulmonary fibrosis being uh, a disease that maybe affects about what one in 10,000 people per year, even if you increase that risk somewhat, you're still gonna be you know, it, overall, your risk is still relatively low. On the other hand, some recent 
evidence has suggested that family members of, of affected people affected by pulmonary fibrosis may have some fibrosis-like changes in their lungs in up to about one in six people. Mm -hmm. So the exact risk we're not entirely sure about, uh, but there is an increased risk there. What I would suggest to people who, who have an affected relative, if you're worried uh, about this, um, as I said, if, if your GP or uh, uh, somebody qualified knows what they're doing, listens to your lungs with a stethoscope, and um, that is quite a good way of, of an initial assessment of deciding whether there is anything to worry there, worry about there or not. Yeah. I mean, I think, Simon, am I right in thinking, I mean, the genetics is not very well understood yet. We're getting better and better at it year by year. Um, so even where there is a clear familial link, you quite often can't say or identify the gene that is apparently causing the problem. Yes, that's absolutely right, Steve. We know something about a number of the genes that confer risk. Uh, I mentioned some related to telomeres, but actually they are innate. You're absolutely right. Those known genes account for a tiny minority. So there is no genetic test. Um, if people want to know whether you can be ge tested genetically, uh, there is no genetic test. It's very much a, a research tool at the moment. Yeah, you may, may come to that in, say, another five years, but we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's great. And so the sporadic is definitely not inheritable? Well, the... Um, Sorry, we say, so I'll just add figures. As I understand it from what, something you said before once. Yeah, the, roughly, so, at the most 20% are familial and at least 80% are sporadic. Yeah, is that the kind yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think people, different people will give you diff, different figures. Uh, some people would say 10%, mm. 90%. Um, the, the ge again, the genes that have been identified in the familial cases are very, very rare in, the, in those people who have uh, pulmonary fibrosis without an affected family member. So again, the, uh, the genetic testing is not going to help you there. Great. So, and, but it's, it's not, again, not just doing it. Fine. An interesting question here, one that I quite often get asked is, can you tell me the difference between this person has said IPF, but we could say, can you tell the difference between pulmonary fibrosis your progressive pulmonary fibrosis that APF is mostly concerned about, and interstitial lung disease. What's yes, I mean, we are plagued by horrible three-letter abbreviations in this field, and, uh, and these, are only, these are only two of them. And, uh, and so I'm not surprised that people get confused because we, you know, we get confused ourselves about it. So thinking about that interstitial, the gap between the air and the blood, anything abnormal in there, is an interstitial lung disease. And that could be fibroblasts and collagen, as in pulmonary fibrosis. If it's fibroblasts and collagen, it's pulmonary fibrosis. But it could be inflammatory cells. It could be the, the, the body reacting to some sort of injury or pneumonia. And that would still be classified as a, an interstitial lung disease, uh, but it wouldn't be fibrosis. So interstitial lung disease is a big umbrella term, and pulmonary fibrosis is one of those interstitial lung diseases, and then the pulmonary fibrosis bit can be divided up into the various different labels, some of which I've touched on. Great. So, I mean, in your hospital, for example, I mean, of the 100 patients you see, what proportion would you classify as having pulmonary fibrosis as opposed to interstitial lung disease, which is not fibrotic? Yeah, probably about half and half, I think, uh, Steve. So there are plenty of people who have non- <laughs> fibrotic, non-scarring types of uh, interstitial lung disease. And um, uh, they, they are, are often something different is going on there. And they are, if it's not a scarring disease, it's more likely to get better either by itself or with treatment. Okay. I mean, there are a num number of questions here which relate to you know, the different terms, as you said earlier on, IPF, chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, rheumatoid arthritis, ILD. Um, and I know from talking to many of these patients that we all, I mean, I was an IPF patient before, as you know, but I was NSIP and then I became IPF. Um, so we all often have a, a number of different diagnoses on the way to an ultimate diagnosis, the one that we, 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 we're, we're treated with. Um, a person here is asking, could you explain <clears throat> the difference between IPF and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Yeah, so this is about diagnostic labels. And you know, I showed you some uh, a slide earlier on about but some of the examples of the diagnostic labels. And in the poll, uh, we, we used some of those as well. Um, what I, you know, so I think what we're talking about here is a philosophy between it's the lumping versus splitting, isn't it? 
we as doctors and specialists like to divide things up into lots of different things and, and try to very cleverly put people in, a, in, in different boxes. Um, a lot of the principles that I, that I hope I've shown you today probably apply to all types of pulmonary fibrosis, I think. So the, uh, what I'm suggesting there is that we may be able to lump them all together and it may not matter too much what they're called. The underlying bio uh, biological processes may well be very similar. And, um, you know, and, and there's, there's, you know, there's other evidence from recent drug trials that that may be the case as well. So we use the term hypersensitivity pneumonitis when we can find uh, an organic antigen like the pigeons or the mold or the fungus or uh, the moldy hay or something like that that we think is triggering an immune response, which is what's leading to the fibrosis. So it really depends. The most confident way to diagnose chronic hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, that's why we call it HP. Um, the most confident way to diagnose is to find that story of uh, an inhalation, usually an ongoing inhalation of some, uh, some sort of dust from something that, that was once alive, um, such as bird dander or uh, molds. So it does depend very much on the history, the story that a person tells and the question, and therefore the questions that they get asked as much as anything else. Yeah, it's very interesting that lumping idea because in a way, I mean, patients, we, let, we, we can lump ourselves because patients with these other, named with these different diseases, you have HP, I have IPF, somebody else has RAILD, we all become progressively breathless, we all have cough, we all eventually depend on oxygen, and we all eventually, sadly, um, you know, pass away with respiratory failure of some kind or another. Um, and it's a really, um, it's a common thing. It feels like the last two or three years of all these diseases are experienced in very similar ways. Would you say yes. that's true? Or? Yeah, I, com I completely agree. And I think the, the, the lumping philosophy has come more and more to the fore in, re in recent years, Steve, I agree. Okay, great. An interesting question here. Um, is there research going on with COVID patients, which will be of help to patients with IPF? Yeah, I think I think IPF is a, is a difficult disease to study, to research, for all sorts of reasons. And I agree with the questioner's um, theme here that actually we may get some very important clues, or hopefully we'll get some important clues about studying uh, diseases other than IPF and then being able to apply them back. I think that may be true for rheumatoid, for example, trying to understand the link between rheumatoid and pulmonary fibrosis. But some people with COVID get pulmonary fibrosis, and particularly if they've had severe COVID and been, and been hospitalized. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably not as common as we thought it might be at the outset of the pandemic. Uh, but I agree with the principle that, uh, that studying any type of disease that leads to scarring in the lungs may reveal pathways and biological processes that are common to many. And again, you know, again, with that lumping philosophy in mind. I agree. Yeah. And somebody similar in a way, the idea that you know, the COVID virus can affect the lungs and might end up in fibrosis. Uh, <clears throat> a person that's asked about having TB as a child, does that increase the likelihood of lung fibrosis? So, so, so TB, tuberculosis, is, mm -hmm. is, uh, if, put, if you have active TB in your lungs, it's a very destructive disease. It causes death of the lung tissue and leads to scarring. But it's not usually progressive. You know, the, the TB comes, it causes the damage, it leaves the scarring, the TB is treated, it's the damage is left, but it doesn't usually get worse. So in that way, it's a, a kind of self-resolving or, or self-limiting scarring that doesn't lead to the progressive problems that, that the more typical type, types of pulmonary fibrosis cause. Yeah. Is there any hope, one question, uh, question asks, about reversing fibrosis. Is there any hope that it's a one day? I, 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 I think the first thing that we, we need to hope for and aim for is the halting process that you described, Steve. Mm -hmm. to, to reverse fibrosis, you've got to take that very distorted part of lung and you've got to get it back looking like it was before. <laughs> and that's going to be a much uh, tougher job. The reversal bit is a bit more long shot at the moment. 
you know, there we've we've talked before, Steve, between the two of us about about um, the the alleged promise of stem cell biology to regenerate damaged lungs. That's very much pie in the sky at the moment. There is no evidence that that can happen uh, in in a person. So. I wouldn't want to get people's hopes up by looking at that sort of thing to say we can we can regenerate a damaged lung. That's for the future. Uh, another interesting question. A uh, person says that they had hypersensitivity pneumonitis for over 10 years and has never smoked. Her nephew passed away five years ago with scleroderma. And she asks, is there a connection? And can I just add a supplement to that? Which yeah. is when you look at familial um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, it often manifests itself as a, a different label yeah. in each generation. Yeah. So yeah. it might be my father had IPF, I have rheumatoid ILD, my son has something different. So it does seem as if there's a lot of connection here. Isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I I agree. So you're right on the on the face of it, the answer to that question is well, you know, if you read the read the textbooks, there's no connection between chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and scleroderma. But I think you're right. I think the genetic uh, risk factors or, or familial risk is more pervasive than that. Um, the diagnostic labels uh, may be different. They may not be correct, but then I'm saying they may not be correct. But we know, for example, for hyper chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that even experts don't agree often. So again, we're coming to this kind of micro, you know, uh, micromanagement and labeling, but maybe lumping progressive pulmonary fibrosis together is a better way to look at it in terms of helping people and understanding the disease. Yeah, sure. And as with that TB question earlier, another person talks about having had near fatal double pneumonia after falling into a river as a child. Yeah. Is it possible that a trauma to the lungs in early life could later manifest itself it's yes, it is an interesting thought, isn't it? And, 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 and the argument there might be that, you know, something, the, the injury to that lung lining leads those cells you know, 50 years later to become senescent, prematurely aged. I have no evidence to support that. The funny thing about pneumonia, usually caused by bacteria, um, COVID more recently, is that usually in the vast majority of people, even if they have very severe pneumonia and the lungs are completely full with pneumonia, it usually heals up. Uh, uh, completely without any residual lung damage or scarring and, uh, and no residual impairment. So, it, so actually the, the resolution of pneumonia is a remarkable healing process that the lungs are normally able to do. It is remarkable when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, yet another one of these questions of um, you know, different diseases of the same, same family. Um, a person says her late husband was diagnosed with mesothelioma, I can never say this, slithelioma, you know, the cancer of the um, pleura, um, with due to exposure to, great exposure to asbestos 40 years ago. <coughs> I've been told, although I have signs of some asbestos, it's not how I got my HP. Could you shed any light on that? Yeah, so um, obviously mesothelioma is a, is a nasty cancer from in the, in the linings outside the lung caused by asbestos exposure, which is not related to interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it has been postulated that, um, you know, lighter exposure to asbestos may lead to some asbestos-related disease. Um, but the general consensus at the moment is that in order to get some type of pulmonary fibrosis due to asbestos, you have to have pretty heavy asbestos exposure. That is, you have to be in a worker who worked directly with it day in, day out for a year or more or equivalent. So light or distant asbestos exposure is probably probably not enough to, call, to be a cause of pulmonary fibrosis, although others would argue it might be a risk factor. So I suppose I'm going to sit on the fence there a little bit on that one. Yeah, okay. So these things are, are complicated. Um, a friend from London who knows who he is, so I'll say hello to him, um, generally says, um, generally the only tests for diagnosis are breathing tests, bronchoscopy and blood tests, I suppose you add to that um, uh, CT scans. Why not include from the start tests for reflux, stomach acidity, acidity sleep apnea and other things? Um, so yes, well, um, there's two aspects really. You, you, one is the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis, which is which is usually a CT scan diagnosis, sometimes supplemented 
by a lung biopsy. Um, when addressing the risk factors, um, which is what you're talking about in terms of identifying esophageal uh, dysmotility or reflux, um, that's really looking for things that you might be able to modify or alter to benefit the person and uh, slow the progression of the disease, for example. So, and, and the link between the reflux and the fibrosis is definitely there, you know, it's definite, but we cannot say for sure that it's cause and effect. So reflux and pulmonary fibrosis go together. Does the reflux cause the pulmonary fibrosis or are the abnormal dynamics of the lungs in pulmonary fibrosis actually predisposing to more reflux? by altered pressures, et cetera. So the only way to prove that is to treat the reflux uh, in a clinical trial and see whether people's pulmonary fibrosis does better. Um, the Americans have done a trial of surgical fund application for reflux uh, with a suggestion of a benefit there. I think the jury is still out. And the other thing I would say is I think a lot of people have abnormal muscular function of the gullet, the esophagus, rather than true reflux, which is a, a problem with the sphincter at the bottom of the gullet. So there's, there's more than one condition under that reflux uh, terminology. And there is a trial um, coordinated by the University of East Anglia involving about 40 hospitals across the UK that's about to start at, to look at that again, isn't it? Yes, they will, be treating, they will be treating acid. Yeah. They'll be treating acid, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, is serious vitamin D deficiency a cause or an effect of pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, vitamin D. Yeah, vitamin D, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble finding... There's a lot of questions coming in, isn't there? Uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll read them to you. Uh, no, there's, vitamin D has been linked to all sorts of... Well, I think, I'm trying to think of a disease that vitamin D hasn't been linked to. It's a very important hormone. It's produced in the skin in response to sunlight. There's very little of it in the normal diet, and many people are deficient, especially in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, especially in the winter, because lack of sunlight. But the problem is, you know, if you are ill, you're probably getting less sunlight... And, and, you, and therefore you're likely to have vitamin D deficiency. So is there any association there link cause or effect? And most of the diseases um, that have been linked to vitamin D deficiency are probably not caused by vitamin D deficiency. So you should follow uh, NHS guidance about keeping yourself vitamin D replete or keeping your vitamin D levels satisfactory. Um, but I don't think at the moment there's any definite link with pulmonary fibrosis. Great. So just to say, I think we will, if everybody's happy, go on for another 10 minutes, because there are a lot of interesting questions still here. Well, more fantastic questions. Um, <clears throat> here's one. My brother and a friend's partner both have IPF. My husband died of IPF last year. My bridesmaid's husband also died. Until my husband was diagnosed, none of us had ever <coughs> heard of IPF. Mm. Is it getting more common? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, is the mm. simple answer. Um, why is that? Are, is it just because we are better at diagnosing it, CT scans are better, etc., or is it truly on the increase? I think it probably is truly on the increase. Research from Richard Hubbard's group in, in Nottingham published some time ago uh, showed fairly convincingly that that was the case. Why? I don't know. No, indeed. <laughs> um, an interesting question here. You said that the confusing signals to the brain cause feelings or symptoms of breathlessness. Yeah. And this person says, surely breathlessness is <coughs> real as a result of the failure in the air sacs oxygen CO2 to exchange, and therefore the lack of oxygen to all other parts of the body requiring it to function, and therefore an increase in demand of the lungs to perform better. So he said- so, This is a very good question, asking about what is the link between low oxygen and breathlessness? And for this presentation, I was going to make, in fact, I started making some animations uh, about this, but they got awfully complex and I, I clearly didn't have time to put them in. And a good job I didn't because I ran over any, anyway. So maybe we could uh, do that another time. Mm -hmm. Now, most people's breathlessness with pulmonary fibrosis is not due to low oxygen. And you will know that because if you measure your oxygen level, either at rest or when you go for a walk with a simple finger pulse oximeter in people, especially with mild or moderate pulmonary fibrosis, it will be normal. So it's not lack of oxygen, especially in the early stages of the diseases, that leads to the breathlessness. I would suggest to you it's the lung stiffness and that neuromechanical uncoupling and interpretation uh, from the brain there. Yes, in more advanced disease, 
uh, people develop low oxygen levels. I think, Steve, you could probably talk to that as well from mm -hmm. personal experience. Um, and then uh, <laughs> oxygen therapy may be helpful. So oxygen therapy is a treatment for low oxygen levels, not for shortness of breath. Yeah, perhaps somebody asked whether you could talk a little bit more about sarcoidosis, because a person here has, which I know is a relatively rare, but a progressive sarcoidosis, fibrosing sarcoid yeah. and scarring, and has had it for seven years. Um, and yet I believe it's quite a small percentage of those with sarcoidosis of the lung that actually... Yeah, so um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, sarcoidosis is another of those diseases that seems to be getting more common. Again, we may be and we may be better at diagnosing it earlier. But, um, but most people with sarcoidosis, uh, although it commonly affects the lungs, don't have bad lung scarring. Some do, if you're unlucky, uh, uh, like the questioner. Um, and it's, you know, sarcoidosis is, a, again, a poorly understood disease where the immune system is overreacting to something, some agent, possibly an external agent that people are exposed to that we don't understand what it is. And it seems to be that ongoing inflammation immune response can in some people lead to some scarring. Often if you treat the sarcoidosis by suppressing the immune reaction and the inflammation, you can get on top of the lung scarring and stop it from going getting worse. Um, but sometimes it can be difficult. So it's not a big cause of pulmonary fibrosis, but clearly it is a problem for those people with sarcoidosis who have that fibrotic type. Yeah. We have two hairdressers worried about the chemicals they use and whether they could have at all been linked with fibrosis. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, there have been reports, but, um, but is that strong enough to make a definite link? Um, I think that's very difficult. Trying to link any exposure to disease, especially if it's, if it's rare, is actually very difficult because something, sometimes things will occur by chance. And so trying to tease out what's cause and effect can be very difficult. Um, I, I don't think that hairdressing chemicals in particular are really a cause of pulmonary fibrosis. Okay. Um, a question about cough, because and this resonates with me as well, because you said quite rightly in the beginning, you often go to the GP to start with, with a dry and persistent cough. But in my case, about halfway through my time with the disease, it became highly productive. I mean, embarrassingly productive at times. Yeah. Um, and very, very difficult and debilitating. Um, why do we know so little about it? And why is there no medication yet? Yeah, cough is cough is such a difficult symptom. Probably about it, we think probably about a third of people with pulmonary fibrosis have a difficult cough in some form, either either dry or productive. Um, again, it's another uh, disease like breathlessness, which is mediated by nerves that sense uh, irritation and then signal up to the brain to induce a cough. Of course, the cough reflex is there for a reason so that if we eat or drink anything and it goes down the wrong way, we can sense that cough, otherwise we would choke to death. So it's a very important protective reflex. And for some reason, in pulmonary fibrosis, as in many other diseases, it becomes oversensitive. So it decides it's going to fire off when there's not, not anything there causing any irritation particularly. So uh, there's a lot of interest from pharma in developing uh, drugs that act on those nerves to suppress the cough reflex. There are many clinical trials going on. So I think in a few years' time, again, the landscape will change in terms of cough treatment, but you're absolutely right. Treatment for cough currently is, is unsatisfactory for many people. Great. Well, look, I think we're going to have to finish at any minute now, but a last question for you, the easy one to finish with. Um, when do you think we'll have a cure for IPF? How many years or months? <clears throat> well, um, we want to try and get a balance here between optimism and over-optimism and, and, and too much pessimism, don't we really, Steve? Um, it isn't going to be months. It's a difficult disease to study. We don't really have a good laboratory model for it. Uh, research is ongoing and, and, and research funded by APF and, and APF's fundraisers is invaluable in that respect. But I think realistically, we're looking at five to 10 years. And you think in five to 10 years, when you define cure, you mean the ability to, I always think of it as somebody a bit like HIV AIDS now. Control it and stabilize it. Yeah. Control and stabilize it. Yes, agreed. Yeah. And then eventually 
maybe in years to come, we'll find absolutely wonderful new things we can do to recover. Great. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Thank you. I mean, sadly, we have come to the end of the webinar. Simon, thank you really for being so generous in giving up your evening to, to talk to us tonight. It was a really stimulating talk. You can see I've never done a webinar with such an amazing group of questions. And I apologize to all those people whose questions we couldn't deal with in the time. Um, if you still are worried about anything, please do get in touch with APF through our, our support line. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I think this has been a really excellent start to the uh, webinar series, so thanks very much. I'd also like to thank, as I said, the audience for participating so actively in the webinar. We had something like 200, I've forgotten the figure now, 220 or 30 registered. We've had 100 and I've lost the figure, but it's a large number anyway, very large number of people present to 150 odd, I think, uh, in this webinar tonight, which has been great. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this evening. Thank you again, Simon. Thank you for to Boehringer Ingelheim for supporting this webinar series and to all the people you know, behind the scenes who made it happen. So see you all in two weeks' time for the next webinar. Thank you.